Hello, today I want to talk to you um, a little bit about a quirk of oil-based extender and also how to store inks and look after them. So to go back to the extender, I am talking about oil-based extender here. So that could be traditional oil-based ink or uh, safe wash ink, but these are the oil-based, not water-based. So oil-based ink, there is a little quirk you should know if you use extender like I do. That's to say very, very um, full-on transparent extender with a little bit of colour added. So maybe like 97% extender and 3% inks. So I'm going to show you um, what happens and then I'm going to explain it to you. So if you look at my uh, plastic sheet here, at the top I've got some ink mixed up. Now this is Prussian blue and burnt umber which if you if you saw my episode on mixing greys you will know is a go-to combination for me for a nice bluey grey. And now I'm going to extend it. So I've got some extender here. Again, this is this isn't safe wash. This isn't Caligo. This is uh, this is Cranfield traditional relief ink, which is what I would normally use to print with. So here's my nice extender, and I'm going to add a little bit. Actually, what I will do is use this one. I'm going to add a little bit of my ink to it to make a nice transparent bluey grey. Lovely. Perfect for the background of a print. So let me put that onto a piece of paper so you can see. Now the quirk of the extender is that these two are the same, exactly the same mix of extender and that colour up at the top. It's just that this one has been sitting for about an hour or so while we've been setting up to film. I mixed that one earlier. So the colour change is due to um, things called transient chromophores. Now, I would love to say that I'm sciency and I know all about this. I do know about it, but I know about it as a printmaker. I know about how it works within my printing. However, I had a long chat to Paul, who is a technician at Cranfield Colours, and he's been really, really helpful in explaining this to me. Um, so a big thank you to him and to Cranfield for helping me out. So what happens is that there is a process in inks where... I th I'm not sure if they're compounds, but I'm going to call them compounds. Uh, compounds called transient chromophores in the ink. As they cure and as the ink dries, they change colour temporarily. Temporarily, they go a sort of brownie colour. Now, normally, you would never see that because it's masked by the ink's colour. The pigment in the in the ink will, you know, hide that. It's a it's very slight. But if you are using extender, which is effectively pigment free ink um, at the kind of concentration that I am, then it becomes very apparent because there's no ink colour to hide it much. So you can see um, and this one will change colour as I'm chatting to you. You can see there is quite a dramatic change of colour there. And indeed, this one is now turning to match that colour. So it's important to know about this because and also to know that it's a temporary effect. This is not going to ruin your print. The print will turn back to the original colour once these transient and the clue is in the name chromophores have the compounds have um, disappeared. It needs UV light for that to happen. So basically, if I were to print my, my print now with this and I hung it up on a sunny day, I would reckon in about 12 hours it would be changing colour and reverting to the bluey grey. It's very variable depending on how much UV it's exposed to um, and, and it does take time. So I can't sort of say, oh, you leave it for X hours in light and then it's all sorted. 
it's it's just a movable feast that so there's a couple of things to say about it the first is that if you are working with this you have to accept that there are times when you cannot see the right color while you're inking up you you can't see that's a blue gray so what i tend to do is i will mix the ink color the solid inks like here to the colors that i want so i've got my bluey gray here and i would mix enough that if I wanted to do various layers of blue grey, I've got kind of a mother load and then I can I know that that is the right colour and I can take out my extender and I can add from that. And I know the colour's right, even if it doesn't look right with the extender in it. So having a sort of mix up at the top with no dryer in it means you can use that knowing it's always going to be the right bluey grey. If you mix your bluey grey as you go along into the extender and the extender's changing colour, it's really hard to get an accurate colour match. So that's how I handle it. And then I, once I've, I'm mixing with the extender, I'd be adding my dryer to the extender that was going to get used leaving that without dryer so that it stayed available for as long as I needed for all the layers I wanted to print. So that's that's the way of handling it. The other thing about this effect is that it does need exposure to light for this transient effect to happen, to disappear. And once it's once it's gone through its process and it's disappeared, it's gone. End of. However, if it's possible if you have prints where you've used a lot of extended ink like this and you've hung them up to dry and it feels dry and then you pop them in the drawer, but that the process hasn't gone through its full cycle or its full process and there are still some transient chromophores remaining on your print, while it is in the drawer, it may turn back to a brownie colour. Now, that isn't the end of the world because all you need to do is take your prints out of the drawer, let the light get at them, let the UV get at them and finish the process. But it's worth knowing that in case you go to them in the drawer and they don't look right. Um, I keep an eye on mine. I now, knowing that as I do, I leave mine in hanging up to dry for a good two or three weeks in the light until I'm happy it's all reverted back to the right colours and that they don't go into the plan chest until they're completely cured um, and hopefully I avoid that problem. So you can see as I've been talking these colours now match um, and it is it is a quirk and it has to, I have to say it's only apparent so obviously because of the way I work. If you don't work in transparent layers like me this is probably not something you'll ever have to address, but I want you to know about it in case you decide to work like me and then you, you wonder what on earth is happening. So to move on from extender, I just want to have a few words with you about um, looking after oil-based inks and using keeping leftover inks, again, based on my conversation with Paul at Cranfield. So the first thing to decide is how you want to buy your ink, whether you want it in a tin, uh, whether you want it in a tube, and also if you want it, I think there are guns as well, you can get ink guns. Um, I've never had an ink gun uh, format, I've only ever worked with tins of ink and tubes of ink, and the thing about tins is it looks like a bargain when you buy it because it's it's cheaper to buy ink in the tin than it is to buy it in individual tubes. But you really need to think about how fast you're going to use the inks because it's false economy to buy a big tin if you are not going to use your inks up at a fairly regular pace. Because if you buy a tin and you don't get through it for years and years and years, that ink is not going to last well. You'd be better off buying a tube and having your ink in great condition, um, just less of it. So it's a false economy to save money on ink that is then going to go off. However, if you do buy a tin of ink, then there are a couple of things that you can do to prolong its life. 
So here is a lovely brand new uh, tin of extender. I would buy these by the bucket if I could because I get through extender so fast that um, frankly, yeah, I could get through a bucket without it going off, no problem. So when it gets here from the factory, um, it has cardboard protection on it. And let me just get that out of the way. And then um, there's a layer of, um, I don't know, is that acetate, plasticky stuff on the top, protecting the top of the ink. Now, this is quite thin plastic and I am clumsy and I always tear it. So the first thing that I do when I get inks is to take this layer off, clean off, scoop all the ink back in, and then I replace it with heavy juicy polythene. So here is this sort of heavier weight polythene, which I know that I can use as a sort of lid inside the tin and I'm not going to rip it. So that's, that's what I do anyway. So here is one um, that I have been using. Let's just put the lid on that one. And you can see there's my, there's my heavy duty polythene in there. The other bit of advice um, that Paul gave me was when you use the ink, and this is, it depends very much on the colour because the thickness of the ink will vary. This, this white is quite liquid, so it doesn't actually show it very well. But when you take your ink out with a palette knife, let me grab one of my trusty palette knives, scrape it off the top as though you were scraping hard uh, butter from the fridge that you wanted to spread on toast. So taking scrapings rather than digging the palette knife down and taking chunks. Because the more you dig the palette knife into the ink, the more surface area you are creating for it to dry out. I would certainly say that of Caligo, um, of the safe wash inks, um, where skinning can be a little bit more of a problem. So always skim across from the top with whatever ink you use because it's it, it reduces the surface area keeps it to a minimum so that's a little tip on tins the other thing i have done recently is to ask ben to make me a um, rather fancy tube of ink display like this now, the advice is to keep your inks out of sunlight. So this folds out out of the way of sunlight and my tins of ink sit on shelves behind there. So it's all out of direct sunlight. But a system like this, um, it just makes life so much easier. I mean, for years I've had all these piled up on a tray out of sight and it's always been a nightmare. And that's why the tubes are so messy because they've all been piled up. If you use a system, we've just put eyelets through some... Um, plywood here and use bulldog clips to hold the inks up and they're easy to get at and they stay cleaner and the other bit of advice is to try and keep the lids and the necks clean which sounds obvious but I it, it can be really difficult actually with ink so yeah if you can keep them clean better and better so storing them like that has been a revelation for me it's just taken me about 10 years to do realize that's what I needed to do so um a system like that works really well. And then I've been asked quite regularly about what do you do with leftover ink? And with oil-based inks, I think the question is really, is it leftover ink that's got dryers in it? Or is it leftover ink that hasn't got dryers in it? If it has dryers in it, then you're on a time limit. So, um, and that time limit also depends on how warm your studio is, whether there's good airflow, all that kind of thing. So if I want to store inks overnight, let's say, if they've got dryers in, I'd probably get away with leaving them overnight. All that I will do is I, I scrape them up to the top of my mixing slab and then I will cover them. And these are little, um, they're for soy sauce. I got them in... Um, Soho in London and they're just soy sauce dishes and I just put one over the top. It doesn't have to be anything as fancy as that as long as you're sort of making a, a protective top. I'm not, I don't tend to put cling film or things that will seal them direct, directly onto the ink because by the time you've pulled the cling film off and it's all got ink on it, it's there's very little ink left so I don't bother with that. I just put a bit of 
a dome over the top to protect them. So these inks along here haven't got any dryer in them. So I, when I mix my inks, I mix up the volume of ink I think I'll need. I don't put dryer in it. And as I pull down a section of ink to use, then I put a little bit of dryer in, mix it, roll it out, use it. And then I go back and take some more because I know that that means that if I have ink left over, it won't have any dryer in it. In which case, these can stay good for, oh, a couple of weeks, something like that, probably easily. So it can last for a really long time. So that's how what I do with, with extra leftover inks. And the other thing which I didn't mention, um, you may wonder why I have some WD-40 here. Um, the other advice I had from Cranfield was that you can also put a very quick squirt of WD-40 over ink to stop it skinning. Um, again, it's not something I've done because I, I haven't felt the need to, but that's they do mention that you can do that if you want to. And finally, I just wanted to show you my tube ringer again. Um, I've been asked a lot about this. It's, it's called a tube ringer. There are numerous versions out there on the market. Uh, this one comes from rather nicely from Eugene in Oregon, um, but and it's quite heavy duty. And that just ensures, let me show you, that you get the last possible, uh, it makes rather a nice corrugated effect, the last possible amount of ink out of your tube. So um, people have said to me, oh yes, but I use a rolling pin, things like that. And great, you know, whatever works for you. But I just mentioned that because people like it. The one drawback of it is that when it arrives, you will go through your house and you will wring out every single tube you possess from tomato paste to toothpaste to this stuff. So, yeah, just be aware of that. Um, so that's quirks of extender, a little bit on looking after excess ink and, and keeping your ink in good condition. So I hope that's been useful and I hope you'll join me again.